Now a lot of you have been asking about Play to Earn Gaming and how it differs from traditional gaming. So to tell you all about it, we have Matt Lobel, the founder of PlayN, which is a blockchain game ecosystem. Matt has an extensive and diverse background as an entrepreneur over the last 30 years in application development, gaming and training and development spaces. Hello everyone, this is your host Roy, welcoming you to a brand new episode of the MetaRoy podcast. Every week on this show, we simplify one aspect of the crypto and the Web3 space. Before we start though, just a quick disclaimer, the following content is informational only and none of it should be interpreted as financial advice. So please do your own due diligence before making any moves in the crypto and the Web3 space. So with that out of the way, let's get started. Matt, thank you for joining us today and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you today on this podcast. How are you doing today? Thanks, Roy. I'm doing great today. I appreciate you having me on the show and... Uh, you you pretty much hit the background uh, for me pretty accurately. Uh, I've done a, a ton of application development um, and e-learning, and uh, I generally fall into the camp as I grow a business in the operations area of the business. And so, project management, I have my hand in that. And uh, and yeah, we're uh, we're creating a uh, game ecosystem that's built on blockchain and has at its heart the idea that the players are the important part of the whole equation. And so it allows them to earn inside games and uh, own their account and then everything that falls under the account, which is your game assets and all of that. So we're really focusing on the players. And, and that's kind of the goal for playing is to bring people into this ecosystem by trying to drop things that make it so darn complex to play one of these games. Absolutely. Matt, I just have a question that what is it that piqued your interest in blockchain tech? I mean, you have been exposed to gaming industry earlier as well, right? So how do you think gaming has changed uh, since blockchain technology came on the scene? Well, you know, to be real honest, Roy, right now it hasn't changed that much. And that's the problem. Um, of a hundred and eighty billion dollar industry, which is what gaming was in 2021, only four to five billion of that was in the crypto space. The largest game is Axie, and that's only running eight million players. Which, when you start to look at the overall landscape of gaming, you realize it's it's tiny, it's insignificant. Um, so it really hasn't uh, impacted it heavily, and that's what I really would like to change. Um, the, uh, the problems are that the technology is a barrier. Uh, you know, most people don't even know what a MetaMask wallet is, but that's the first thing most of these games ask you to install. Um, they're hard to find. They're not in a lot of traditional distribution channels. So you have to be actively be looking. Um, a lot of them are gambling, basically. I mean, Axie to just get uh, into a basic axie, you have to drop a couple hundred US dollars. And to get um, a competitive team, you really have to drop more like a $1,000. Um, so there's there's all these barriers. And then just the gameplay. I mean, most of these games were written by people who are more technology oriented and not not gamers themselves and not game developers. So there's all these barriers, and what we're trying to do is drop and remove those barriers of entry and let people just play games, let them have fun with it. Um, and, you know, from my background going into this, um, I was already developing uh, games, but I actually became director of operations for a crypto education company. And we created a docu-series and then the light bulb went off and I was just like, you know, this is really the way to evolve these games. I was already trying to kill play to win or pay to win rather. Uh, and uh, now I'm like, you know, I shouldn't just kill pay to win. I should actually make it where people can earn inside the games. And so that's what we're doing. And, and contrary to a lot of these games that are just trying to sell a bunch of NFTs and you know, do a cash grab, basically. Uh, we're trying to create a player-based economy 
um, where truly they're participants in the process and they truly do play. And as a result of successfully playing, they earn. Got it. Got it. For people who don't know what play to earn is, essentially it's the way to earn while playing the game itself. Axie Infinity being one of the largest player in this space. Is my understanding correct? Yes, it, it is correct. And just to be very blunt on this, I, I don't think a lot of companies have really pulled this off well because some companies are trying literally to pay players to play the game. And that's a zero sum game. You can't do that. You know, you, you, you can magically pull money out of the sky by doing a token offering. But once that money runs out, it's gone. Um, and you literally just, there's no way to have a sustainable economy. What we're really doing and kind of the fun part of this, Roy, is we're actually like a mini uh, government where we're the Federal Reserve of the government and we're trying to figure out how to make the economy go so that it doesn't overheat, it doesn't deflate, but it just has nice steady growth. So the way we're approaching it is we're creating a standard game. Like these are just regular games that you would sit down and play. It's just that built into our games, we have mechanics for players to be able to sell assets that they collect inside the game. And we're just calling it an auction house. It's just like an auction house in real life. Roy, if you found a really cool sword, um, you could put that up for sale in the auction house. Uh, if somebody else looks at it and goes, that's a really cool sword, then they'll start bidding on it and others might bid against them and the price goes up. And just like a real life auction, you get the proceeds from that sale. Now we do take a 10% auction fee, just like a real life auction house. Um, but that's healthy for our ecosystem too, because that provides liquidity for our players. So, um, what we're doing is really creating traditional games and creating a, a ability for players to earn through active participation in the game. Got it. Got it. Can you talk about the tokenomics a bit? Uh, how does the ecosystem of play and work? Sure. And it's, it's very, uh, we try to keep everything somewhat simple because the more complexity you add to it, it the worse it becomes, I found. Um, but, the actual economics of these games is never simple, uh, even though we put it in simple terms. So when we launch a game, like our first game is Darkland Wars, and that's a massively multiplayer real-time strategy game. Um, when we launch a game, we're going to put 500,000 of our GMG, which is game gold, that's our token, put 500,000 from our pool behind the game to back the game. Think about it as the way uh, economies used to work in the United States and still work in some areas of the world where you actually put a hard asset behind your currency. Uh, the dollar used to have gold. Um, and so that's actually why I called it game gold, because uh, we're backing our currency with gold. And and that to me was kind of a, a jab at the United States for going off the rails. Nice jab. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Well, and different countries use different things. I believe, for example, Russia, I think uh, they, they back the ruble with oil reserves um, and different countries do it with different types of reserves. So our reserve is game gold. It goes under each game. But here's what's important. Um, when we push out our tokens, we're doing 100 million. We're not going to ever create a new token after that. We're not burning tokens either. So we have a fixed limited supply that's going to sit in there. 500,000 goes underneath each game. We're going to eventually have 60 games in our ecosystem. So, 300, so uh, 30 million of the game gold is going to be under games backing them. So all of a sudden, our pool shrinks to about 70 million. We start talking about token holders. Some of them are going to choose to hold the token. Um, and that pulls out more from the pool. Some people are going to invest and that pulls out more from the pool. And then as players bring real money into the games, they're going to have to do it through GMG. And that brings more money out of the general ecosystem and into the games. So when you start looking at this and you start pulling the numbers for how many players we could have playing the game, 
you start to realize that the supply of GMG is going to get super tight, super quick, which we're hoping for because what we want to do is provide value to the players, but we also want to provide value to our token holders. And so the people who come in and have confidence in our venture and, and buy tokens uh, either in the seed round or private rounds or in the public rounds, we want them to make a profit. I mean, that's kind of why people invest, right? You know, they, they want to make money. Everybody wants to move ahead. So we want to provide value uh, through our tokenomics to everybody. And we do that through tightening the supply gradually. Got it. Got it. And GMG is also your governance uh, token, right? Uh, if I understand it correctly. That is correct. So GMG is going to back the games. It's also going to be staked uh, in order to get uh, the player will, will get some rights in voting. Uh, we're going to have quarterly uh, issues that will come up for vote and uh, they're going to range. Like um, once we get 60 games, we'll have to start polling the, the uh, audience, essentially the stakeholders, our players and say, hey, do we want to retire any of these games? You know, we've got these games that, that seem to have lower participation. Should we look at retiring them? If we do retire games, hey, which of these games should take its place? And we start to make decisions like that as a community. Um, if people feel that there's abuse in a game, you know, we have to bring that up as a governance issue. So there's all these different ways that the players are going to have a say in how this is run. Now, it's not a, it's not a DAO. I don't want people to get the, uh, the idea that it is a DAO um, because it's not. Because we're going, to, we're going to put specific issues in front of the community. But what it is, is it's a organization that values the opinions of the players. And that really hasn't, not a lot of companies in the gaming space do. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. But, but Roy, I'm a gamer and I love games and I love the people I've played with. Uh, even the people in the games that you hate, the, you know, I love to hate this person because they drive me insane. Um, and we've all had those experiences if we've been a gamer. Um, but even those people I love because they bring fun and spice to the game that otherwise it would be just too, too plain. So the, everybody deserves to be, be able to kind of weigh in. Um, and that's real important to me. Absolutely. Matt, you have obviously talked about the technological barriers, the financial logistical barriers. What about the gameplay barriers that a lot of gamers are disappointed with the quality of games? What are you uh, thinking, what is your vision in this respect? How are you making these games more interesting? Sure. Now, here's here's the interesting part: is games are super sophisticated right now. I mean, if I want to go play a tower defense game, um, I can download download Clash Royale or any of another you know half dozen games and have a great gameplay experience. So there's not a mystery as far as what it takes to create a great tower defense game. And the same goes for every category. You know, there's first person shooters, there's survival games. All of these have best of class games and there's usually a number of them. <clears throat> so what we really want to do is we want to approach this as a game development company. And that is how we're doing it and create games that are best of class. And we're going to have six different verticals, um, everything from... Uh, you know, real-time strategy games to first-person shooters to tower defense games, almost everything that's player versus player. Um, and, and that really is what we're sticking to. You won't find Candy Crush, for example, in our game portfolio. So in each one of these verticals, we plan on having 10 games. And that does a couple of things for us. We're not going to be the Apple Store you know, you're not going to go and get lost in the number of games that we have, because let's be honest, you go into Apple, you go into Google, and what you find is uh, some pretty horrific bad games, uh, just like in the crypto space, you know, that nobody, nobody's immune to it. You go onto Steam and you can find some really bad games when you start to search. Um, what we want to do is curate these games and have 60 really great games so, Roy, if you're really into tower defense and you go in and you play one of our tower defense games and you play it for a year and you go, OK, you know, I I'm kind of over it. You know, and, and we all get to that point with even the greatest games. 
then you can go and look and say, well, I still want a tower defense game. And you can go find one of the other nine and have confidence that you may or may not like the game. I mean, I'm not telling you you're going to love every game in there because everybody has different tastes, but you can know for certainty that it's going to be a high quality game. Um, And so whatever kind of genre you're into, you can be assured that there's going to be 10 high quality games in that genre uh, within our verticals, of course. Got it. And uh, you obviously have a partner program in place, which I saw on your website. So uh, are you also getting indie indie developers to collaborate on this ecosystem? Yeah, it's going to be a a little bit, um, a little bit of a hybrid, if you will. Uh, We're putting in place APIs and we'll have three different APIs in place. And those APIs are going to be designed to be able to hook into a game and give them capabilities of our ecosystem. What we're going to be doing as we launch the partner program is looking for indie game developers to fill one of three roles. So let's just say, Roy, you are in, you're the head of uh, Meta Roy's gaming and you have a game that is in alpha production right now. You might fall into a couple of different camps for us. It might be A, Roy's run out of money and he really needs this project to get some funding. And we come in and we say, look, you know, we love your game. It's a great fit for our ecosystem. Um, We're going to either A, buy the game outright from you um, and then, you know, bring you on board as as a development consultant, that sort of thing. B, we're going to partner with you and we're going to bring your game on as a as a partner in it and invest in finishing it. Um, Or C, we might say, okay, you know, we love what you're doing. And um, we just want to come in and let you do it on our ecosystem. And then we'll, you know, do some kind of a revenue share. It depends where the indie game company is at, because there are a lot of projects out there, Roy, that, that are struggling. And, and I, I, I say that, you know, with, with as much sympathy as I can for those developers, because been there, done that. Um, and, and so, you know, whatever makes financial sense, we're going to have uh, coming out of the public round, we're going to have a nice war chest and we're going to use that to um, to acquire games to come in. And whether that's outright purchase of the game, outright purchase of the company, if they have multiple games that we like or partnership with the company so that they come in either as equal partners or as a revenue share agreement, uh, each situation will be unique. And all I can tell you is I'm going to have my, my fingers really tightly pinching every penny that comes out. So I'm going to find the best um, arrangements for play in so that we can have a dynamic growing ecosystem, great games within it. And when we do partner with somebody that we have amazing partners, you know, that are really invested. So that's, that's my goal. Got it. Got it. Do you have any competitors in this space? What are some other projects like you who are also working in this space? I know one called Moonstream. Uh, it's also uh, trying to build an ecosystem of themselves. But do you have any other competitors top of your mind? So there are um, there are a variety of competitors. Uh, they kind of run the gambit. And uh, in our pitch deck, we put them on a scatter chart. So we can kind of like look at where they are and what they're doing. There aren't a whole lot that are building um, game ecosystems. Um, Moonstream, for example, uh, I'm actually talking with Sam over there and he's a great guy and um, I enjoy his project and I actually may integrate some of their uh, some of their work into our project. Um, But they're not doing the exact same thing we are. Um, You know, I've talked with others that are kind of doing closer to what we're doing, um, but they're doing it more like platformers and 2D games and that sort of thing while we're trying to hit the AAA market. There are uh, there are organizations out there, um, but it just doesn't seem like they're really trying to hit what we're trying to hit in terms of the sweet spot. And in addition to that, we really haven't talked about this yet, but what we're really focused on right now is the interoperability of assets. Um, because right now, uh, the whole NFTs and I, I don't like using the word scam, but I've used that a number of times. Um, because it's kind of like this. If, if Roy, 
I have a Ferrari to sell you. Um, and you're like, wow, yeah, I'd love a Ferrari. That'd be a great car to tool around in. And I say, okay, I'm going to give you this Ferrari for $50,000. You know, that's quite a bit under market. So we're good there. You're, you're excited. Here's the catch. You can't drive it off my property. And you're like, um, okay, I can't take it off your property. That's right. It has to stay on my property. All of a sudden, that's not such a great deal for a Ferrari. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> um, can't even go to the neighbor town. Um, that's a big problem because that's the NFTs in a nutshell right now. I'm going to sell you an NFT. It's got to stay here in this wallet. Um, I can sell it to somebody else. That's great. But And I do own it. But it's all it is is a pointer on a blockchain which points to a server. What happens when that company goes out of business? Who's hosting your NFT now? You still own the blockchain address. Um, but does anybody get excited about owning a blockchain address? So what I want to do is I want to take the game assets that we have and make them transportable between our games. Between our games and the playing with friends metaverse, which is underpinning all of our games. So if you get this really cool skin, now, Roy can take that skin and he can show it off in another game. Now, it might transform a bit because if you take a skin from Darklin Wars and you put it into a, oh, let's say a, a Western-based theme, it doesn't look really uh, uh, good to have a flaming sword in a Western game. So it might change to maybe a gun that has flames coming out of it. But you can transport it. Or you can transport it into the playing with friends metaverse and now everyone who plays uh, any of our games can see it. So you can meet up with friends that don't play the same games you do and say, hey, check out my skins, and you can share those with them. Now, what we really want to do, though, is we don't want to stop there. We want to allow our assets to go outside of the play and ecosystem uh, to any other open metaverse that goes on our same standards. And we're using the standards that are developed by Pixar and NVIDIA, so they're not not, not small players, you know, they've got a little bit of clout. Um, and we use the USD graphic standard and that's what we want to do is, is make those assets transportable outside of our ecosystem so that I can sell you that Ferrari Roy and you can use it in my property and you can also use it in the neighbor's property and you can start to drive that puppy around town. <laughs> so that's the goal is to make these assets really, truly transportable. Awesome, awesome. I would, I would actually be happy just to have FIFA right now on the blockchain, and I can transport my skins all around and take my team anywhere I want to. But yeah, I, I completely agree with what you said, and uh, I think it's a very imp in interesting uh, angle. That, for example, you mentioned that uh, plane itself is building the a metaverse for itself, right? And that's correct. Uh, the assets will be interoperable in these, right? So yes. Uh, do you think this will be the future of the gaming industry, for example, or uh, do you think uh, there's something else going to take over? Uh, what do you think about the future of gaming? Yeah, and I do, I do see this as the future of gaming. What we're going to do, I mean, if if you, this is not in the white paper, so I don't think I'm divulging any secrets because anybody who can ask me can get this answer. But um, this is probably one of the first times I've actually expressed it on a podcast, so you get an exclusive there, but. What we'd like to do is what I really envision for this is I envision um, involving a, uh, AR into this and having the ability at some point to blend reality with games, whether that's through an Oculus type of device or any other type of device that might be, because I, I really do think that from a tech standpoint, we're only five to 10 years away from being able to have truly portable um, AR devices, and that could be contact contact lenses that are inserted or it could be glasses like Google Glass. Um, but either way, what I really want to do is I want to blend games into life. Um, you know, what really scares me is those, uh, those shows where you see that the people are hooked into the machines and they're taken over by the machines and they're, you know, they're in some kind of alternate, uh, metaverse. Uh, I don't want that, Roy. I don't want to be hooked into a machine, but it would be super cool to be traveling through an augmented reality where you can see everything that's real. And then just as real is the game. 
And that's what I would like to, to evolve into. So that if you play Darklin Wars, you could play Darklin Wars anywhere and you just see the game pieces in front of you. You can make the adjustments in real time or you can also go one step further than that and say this metaverse now encompasses the actual earth. Um, so I, I know I'm getting really super deep in this, but you know, you could literally say, well, I can build artificial things in my real world. And anybody who is in the metaverse with me can see any of this. You want to come over to my house? Be careful of the moat that I built over there. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's so many different cool things that could be evolved. That's what I think the future of gaming is. Um, it's going to take a little bit of, of time to get there. But what I would really dig is is being able to be in my house, hanging out with friends and say, hey, let me open up a portal to our game. And boom, this portal appears that we can all see because we're all hooked into the AR devices and we can literally go through it and go into one of the games that that are in the ecosystem. Uh, now I'm painting a, like I said, this is five, 10 years. I, I believe that this will come. Uh, it'll take a little bit of time. It takes a lot of computing power. Um, but that's where I want to go to. Um, you know, that's not, that's not playing of today or playing in three years, but it is playing eventually. I'm starting to think, uh, that, uh, I'm sure you have seen ready player one and, uh, yep. I'm starting to think, uh, Steven Spielberg has taken some notes from you and, <laughs> Uh, you might just be <laughs> the Oasis's founder for me, to be honest. And uh, the way you are, you just described uh, the future of gaming. I'm, <laughs> it, it, it really looks like a, I mean, a Ready Player One scenario for me, <laughs> to be honest. You know, a lot of these science fiction writers have really nailed it, and and that's both scary and exciting. I mean, because there's a lot of things that that I see are in science fiction that are going to be fact, and I've said for a while that they're very scary things. Um, you know, I've heard Elon Musk talk about, for example, the takeover of AI and how that's a real danger. And I, I've been saying that for 15, 20 years, that, that that's an, an actual real danger um, that we can't ignore. Um, and Isaac Asimov, the famous science fiction writer, knew that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I think I think it was 40, might even be 50 years ago. So I'm I'm not exactly a revolutionary in my eyes. Um, but I do have a vision for how things can evolve. And uh, it's an exciting vision, I think. And, and it starts really with the creation of this blockchain gaming ecosystem. And then it evolves from there. But, but here, let me, because I do want to cover one thing. And this to me is like more exciting than any of that. It's the way play to earn can change people's lives. Um, I've got a friend, uh, a wonderful friend that lives in South America. And um, in South America, a really good job is paying about 400 US dollars per month. And, um, and, and that's, that's like a good living wage. I was discussing this and I was like, you know, this, the scenario we talked about earlier of the sword that goes into the auction house, that person gets that sword and they go, you know, I could use this, but I've got a pretty good sword already. I'm going to put that in the auction house. Um, people from other countries start to look at it and go, yeah, I like that sword. I want to buy it. And you get four or five bidders bidding on it. The price skyrockets. It winds up selling for the equivalent of uh, $1,000 US. We get a take of that by about 100 bucks. That person gets in their bank account $900. And, and my friend said, you know how that could change the life of somebody? That's two months of salary and all they did was find a sword and sell it. A sword that doesn't actually exist. That to me is, is the exciting part because I am a capitalist at heart, Roy. I love capitalism. And um, there's a big argument going on in the US right now, capitalism versus socialism. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm all for redistributing wealth. Uh, socialism wants to do it at the end of a gun. You know, if you don't give your taxes, you go to jail. That's forced redistribution. I look at it as, man, let's get voluntary redistribution. The person who bought the sword for a thousand bucks is happy as can be because they got their sword. The person who sold the sword and got $900 cash in their pocket, they're happy as can be because they just made money. 
that's redistribution of wealth at, at its finest. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I do agree with your point. And uh, even a lot of countries in uh, Southeast Asia, for example, have entire economies uh, depending upon, uh, for now, Axie Infinity. But yep. I would I would assume that these would move to something like uh, the plane ecosystem once it is up and running. So I'm really hopeful about the future of play to earn gaming. And uh, I think you're doing a great job and I completely support you on that. So uh, I just had one question. Uh, it's not it's not a question. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you if you had a message for the audience, for uh, people who are developers out there, who are like new in the crypto space also, for example. What would you ask them? What how what would your pitch be like to uh, ask them to build on play? In? Well, you know, here here's the thing: is is uh, developing is hard. Like I, I I can speak from personal experience, and I know that there's people out there just grinding and grinding away. Um, I would love to to know about other projects. I mean, one of the things we're doing right now is just kind of investigating other projects and seeing what's out there. Because once we get our public offering out. Uh, we're going to be looking at partnering with folks. So um, the first thing I would say is, hey, email me. Uh, let me know about what you're doing because uh, at the very least, I, I'd love to uh, to check it out and and to give you some encouragement. I really am not. I'm a I'm a extraordinarily competitive person. Like I I uh, coach uh, football voluntarily, and anybody who's ever played for me will know that. Uh, that the thing that they've always heard me yell at them is finish, finish, finish. Um, boy, I'd, I'd, I'd lose my voice yelling finish at some of my players. And what I mean by that is be persistent, get to the end. Don't leave anything on the table, like give it your all. And, and that's what I'd say to the developers. It's hard, man. I mean, just put everything you can into it and keep spreading the word. Um, you know, so if there's a great project, I'd love to hear about it. I, I would love to uh, see if that's a fit for for a partner uh, program when we get to that stage. Uh, we've got to get through our public offering. That's big on on my plate right now. My finish mantra for myself is is get through the seed and uh, private rounds to get to the public round and get that public round done because then this project is just on rails and going fast. So for all the developers out there, be be persistent. Uh, keep keep chugging along. I know it's difficult. Uh, let me know about your project. Would love to. Uh, would love to at least meet you and chat. Absolutely. And uh, uh, just as a, a FYI, uh, the seed round for uh, Plane Ecosystem is closing in third quarter of 2022. I think it's September, right? If I'm not wrong. That's that's actually the public. The public round is going to be opening in uh, mid September. We're going to be going into the seed round here within a couple of weeks. Um, now, we're very limited on what we can do as far as the seed and the private rounds um, because we are uh, making our SEC filings. Uh, one one difference between our project and a lot of projects is we're not trying to hide anywhere. A lot of projects are located in the Bahamas or located in this other country, and they're trying to do that to get away from regulations. Um, we're embracing the regulations because we don't want our investors to have anything to worry about. We're following all the guidelines. Um, so those seed and the, uh, and the private rounds, those are only open to what the SEC calls an accredited investor. So you have to meet certain financial requirements. The public round is open to everybody. So um, we're doing our seed round first, then followed by our private round and then the public round mid-September. Got it. Personally, I'm just waiting for 2023 when Darklin Wars launches and I get to play it. So <laughs> I just hope we can play it soon enough. I can't wait for it, to be honest. Well, that that's great. Hey, uh, definitely uh, uh, shoot shoot me over something. Uh, actually, join our Discord and shoot me a message in there and uh, I'll get you into our alpha uh, group and you can play around with it and give your opinions and help us to refine it. Awesome, awesome. I'm a gamer at heart and I love uh, testing games also as well. And I've done it in the past, so I would love to help you out, definitely. And uh, all uh, the links to reach out to uh, Matt are in the description below. If you guys want to check that out, uh, I've left it in the description or the show notes, depending upon uh, where you're uh, listening to this interview. 
on that note matt uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today it was it was great learning about your background your journey and uh, about all these insights into play to earn gaming and uh, about play in as well and thank you for sharing this with our audience and i wish you and play in all the best well thank you very much for having me on roy i really appreciate it and uh, i enjoyed the conversation thank you